So we're taking a break from the B and M's. Uh, this is a Six Flags in-house panel for Goliath, the RMC at Six Flags Green America, and I was actually the uh, opening lead for the ride. I was there opening day. I sent the first train. And I rode it before anyone else. Uh huh. So I actually know a lot about this ride. Uh, dispatch buttons right there. All restraints lock, all restraints release. Exit gate, uh, budget cut. One of the reasons I really despised this ride was it was kind of the epitome of Six Flags at the time. You know, cheaping out on everything. They were so behind in construction on that thing. They cut so much stuff that was supposed to be on there. A lot of theming. Uh, even the lift motor was supposed to have a little housing that went around it. Nope, they didn't build that. So it's just exposed to the elements. Uh, same with the transfer track, although I think they, they did finally put that in, um, I think last year, two years ago. But yeah, this ride was supposed to have an exit gate. Uh, this is the exact same panel as New Texas Giant, which is why it has the exit gate. But they decided, uh, no, we don't want to spend $1,000 on a magnet and a gate. We're just going to have to put a terrible turnstile there that's from the front gate from when we opened. And leave Iron Wolf's gate there. Um, so these buttons here are to indicate when the restraints are locked and to unlock individual cars and to lock individual cars. So when it first opened, the way that they would check restraints was there would be four team members total and two team members would start at the front, go all the way to the back and check only the seat belts. And the two people behind would come by, push down all the lap bars and check those. And so when it first opened, uh, it was kind of not great that proce that procedure with how the buttons work because you could only lock all of the cars at once. And so if someone towards the back pulled down the lap bar while the people, while the seatbelt people hadn't gotten there, but the lap bar people were ready, then you'd unlock that car. And another annoying thing was anytime you unlocked a car, all four restraints in that car had to be pulled all the way up and all the way down. It's called cycling. Um, but then shortly after it opened, they changed it so you could press individual buttons to lock them or press them again to unlock them. So then the way it would work is the two people would go by. As soon as they got done with the car, you would lock it one by one as they went. Uh, and this is the opposite of Raging Bull, where when they're all locked, registered as locked, the lights are all off. Uh, when they're not locked at all, they'll be completely illuminated. And when there's a restraint that's not far down enough, they will be blinking. And this ride suffered from New Texas Giant because it wasn't supposed to have seatbelts. And um, there's a panel on the back of each car with four lights on it that tell you which seat specifically is not registered as locked. However, as part of the lawsuit with New Texas Giant, um, the plaintiff had uh, one of their arguments was that the team members didn't properly check the restraint. All they did was see that the green light on that seat was on. And uh, that's why she fell out. So they put this little button on the back that no one was supposed to use. But, of course, we did. Because it was annoying if you had two larger people, or four larger people, in a car. You couldn't necessarily tell which one of them was too big. And so you'd have to look on the back. And so the way they wanted it was you just had to guess and keep trying, and then eventually this would turn off. Uh, but I usually just pushed the button and looked, and then the team members weren't supposed to do it, but I cared about capacity. So I kind of looked the other way when they did it, even though I trained them not to. Um, so here's that right start enable that Six Flags loves. Um, and then, so when the operator restarts it from a ride stop, well, the supervisor, um, in a lift stop, you only use the ride start. But when maintenance is restarting it, they ride start, and then they use the lift start individually. Why that is, I have no idea.
Six Flags just likes to do things weird. Um, Spiel Select. So this was actually pretty cool. Uh, when you had an the auto position, they would play normally. Uh, it actually annoyed me the way that the Spiels would play, though, because it was activated. The load Spiel would play when the train parked, and so you'd usually be talking, so the people coming on would usually miss the first part of the Spiel. And then the unload Spiel would play as soon as the station block was clear. So it would start playing before the train and the transfer had even started advancing. So by the time, you know, the back of the train was into the station, they didn't even hear it. So I usually just talked over it. Or I uh, would just keep it in the... Uh, so the downtime one would disable the spiels, and then when you press the spiel start, you would play the downtime spiel. Goliath. <laughs> I, I don't remember it, actually. I'm not going to try it. Then weather... Um, would do the same thing as automatic, but every five or so times that you pressed all restraints lock, it would play a weather advisory spiel. So like if weather was coming, it would say, operation this ride is dictated by weather conditions due to the possibility of inclement weather. You're not guaranteed a ride at this time. Uh, but something a little neat that I kept to myself was no one knew how to activate it, because like I said, when we uh, opened, we would just use these buttons to... Uh, lock the cars individually, but I knew that once they were all locked, I should press this, and every five times it would play the weather spiel, and no one could figure out why I was the only one who knew, and I didn't tell anyone, because I, you know, it's just me. Uh, trouble light would blink, and it would also play an alarm that you could not turn off until you reset the trouble light. Uh, most common thing was there's these uh, photo eyes in the transfer track, that were not properly aligned or something. So like five times a day, it would uh, trouble light and say uh, train and transfer not found or something. Uh, next screen, so that has to do with uh, this guy. And when you press and hold it, it would pop up with like a statistics screen, but it was called statistics. Statistics. Not statistics, statistics. And it would have like your daily, weekly, dispatches, hourly. Um, let's not get it of ourselves though. Uh, uh, lift stop, right stop, east stop. Um, each button does the functions of the previous two. And the button that you would press would be the one that would blink. So if you press the ride stop, it would be blinking and the lift stop would be illuminated because the lift stop is also uh, activated. If you press the stop, this one would blink and these two would be illuminated. Or, if you're like me, anytime you press the ride stop, you also press the lift stop so they would both blink because it's more satisfying. Uh, so on these newer panels, most of the functionality is on the touch screen so you don't need a ton of maintenance buttons. Auto maintenance transfer. Maintenance enable would let them uh, send trains without the enable button and restart the ride without someone going to the bottom of the lift and pressing the jog lift button. ESR reset resets, resets the ESTAT relay, I think is what that stands for. Then acknowledge uh, when you have a trouble light, you would switch into maintenance mode, and then right here it would pop up what the error was. And then you would press acknowledge, and then it would go blank, and you could restart the ride. And I liked this. Read operating instructions before use. Six Flags, everything was super legal. Like the lawyers must have been, oh, make sure you put a little disclaimer on there just in case anyone operates, even though no other rides in the world have that on there. But that's a little neat. Uh, this is the, the Spiels and the uh, sections you could talk to. So if you want to talk to the queue, you push and hold that. If you want to talk to the people in the exit, you talk to that. If you want to pe talk to the people on the lift hill. And also the brake run, even though the speakers were put on the trim brake, and the ride does not have friction brakes, so it would never stop at the trim brake, so there would never be a reason to talk to people out there, because there would never be a train out there. It would be in the transfer track. Once again, when Six Flags is designed these rides, they don't talk to each other and figure this stuff out. 
Uh, I think our eventual solution to that was to turn the speakers around so that it would blast toward the station so hopefully people in the transfer would hear it. Uh, these are load-unload spiels. Uh, I usually, because I didn't like how the spiels activated, I would leave it in that uh, downtime mode so the spiels wouldn't play and then I would just press them myself. The unload one with my toe, usually. Take my shoe off. I was very dedicated to making sure I was the perfect operator and all of my guests had the perfect spieling experience. Uh, all call would talk to all zones, weather, this was the weather downtime spiel, and Goliath had great spiels. I loved the, uh, your battle with Goliath is discontinued. <laughs> it was cool. And then this one uh, is the lengthy downtime. It would tell people that the ride was going to be closed for an extended amount of time and to get out of line. Your SOL. And sometimes when uh, leads who didn't know what they were doing, and didn't know that there's this uh, thing right here called downtime and spiel start. Oh, I bet that, I bet that would pay downtime spiel. Nope, they would press this one and create mass havoc in the line because no, everyone thought they had to get out of line when really it was uh, someone threw up and the ride would be up in five minutes. Uh, looking at here, so like the B&Ms had those uh, status lights or oc black occupied lights. Uh, on the newer coasters, it's just on the panel, what block it's in. So these are the position of the proximity switches. So the entrance, the middle, and the end. Uh, something really annoying about this ride. Six Flags did a terrible job programming it. So it had this section right here, and it was supposed to tell you if someone let go of a button, like this count would increase. But I don't know how this is helpful at all, because you would have to have known beforehand what the count was. And I didn't know if it, like, yeah, I don't think it reset daily. It reset, like, monthly or something. Uh, and something super annoying was that if someone let off within, like, six inches of being in the park position, when you try to move it again, it would not move. And you had to have maintenance come out and move it. So that was a pretty common downtime when people's thumbs got tired and they accidentally let go. Uh, that was a really common downtime, actually. And it's still not fixed. The, oh, no, actually, they did release a patch, I think in 2017, that fixed that. And they actually uh, increased the speed in which the train enters the station. But the way it's programmed is there's this set of drive tires in the back of the station. And, you know, Raging Bull, you dispatch it, the train leaves, the drive tires stay on, and the next one just comes in. But this one, when the black station block is clear, the drive tires turn off, then these ones turn on, and then these ones turn back on. But these ones would not turn on to full speed at uh, in time for the train to reach there. So every single time the train comes into the station, it would squeak. It would uh, have these drive tires pushing at a certain speed, and then it would reach these drive tires, which are moving slower. <sighs> it compresses the train. It was so, it was so stupid. Uh, this is the lift hill. These are the this photo eyes at the base of the lift. It's it's always illuminated, I think, to disable it because they realized it wasn't necessary. This is at the top of the lift. Uh, these are the positions. So f fully in engaged means that all of the cars on the lift or on the train are fully on the lift. You were not supposed to press a lift stop or any sort of stops with the train only partially on the lift because then it would be more difficult for the motor to have to start with some train not on the lift because it would have to pull it from behind from the base of the lift onto the lift hill and that wasn't really good for it. Uh, the park position, so if the transfer wasn't clear in time that the train got up here, it would stop. Uh, it would actually slow down though before it got to the top to try and give you more time. So if you've ever ridden Goliath and the, the lift hill slowed down for a couple seconds or even for half a second, that's why. And then these dots, it would kind of just time, kind of just give you an indication of how close the train was to the brakes. This would tell you uh, how fast the train was going, or how long it took the train to get from the end of the lift hill to the entrance of the trim brake. It was usually about 32 seconds. This is pretty slow. Uh, when it, The colder it is, 
the slower it would run. I think I had seen some even 30 seconds, and that's when that thing is hauling, when it's super hot. Uh, but you don't want it to be too hot, because then uh, once it enters the brake run, it'll be going too fast, and that causes a trouble light. So when we had hot days during the summer, it would keep trouble lighting because it would keep overspeeding into the turn brake, and so their solution was uh, to just take a car out of service to reduce the weight. Yep. Not. Let's throw another brake or two on here. Now let's let's just take a two rows out of service every day. This is a proximity switches. Uh, the train could not stop on this brake. So if you press an e-stop once it was cleared the lift, it would not stop until it reached the first set of drive tires in the transfer. These are just uh, some stuff. Uh, this is the dispatch interval. So once this, uh, the ride would let you dispatch once this got to zero. Uh, but we were technically not supposed to dispatch until the train had entered the transfer track. But, you know, I cared about efficiency, so if we, uh, if we were moving fast enough, I just sent it whenever. And then it would just slow lift up the lift, no big deal, who cares. Uh, this will tell you whether the Q gates are open or closed. Uh, there's no train on the track in this uh, this image, this was after closing, and this would tell you your dispatches. Uh, a good, well, when I worked there, a good hourly was about 22, which is what, four or five hundred riders an hour, pretty embarrassing. I think the top score of all time is either 32 or 36. I think I got a 32, but I wasn't up there for the 36. And it's very satisfying when you dispatch it at the proper interval because the train comes into the trim brake and they just glide straight into the station without stopping. And um, this down here will tell you uh, what the lift was in the high or idle position. And here's the here's the dots with the train going around the course. Uh, I did actually witness this ride valley. It did once. It was pretty cold. They didn't put enough weight in the train, and it valleyed right here. I witnessed it uh, go through the dive loop, and I'm like, wow, that thing is going so slow. And then it went over the ZRG stall, and it was. I th I thought it wasn't going to make it over that. It was. It barely made it over that, and then it stopped here. I think all they did was just push it. And then we opened later that day with a different train. Yeah, this was that day when they finally got it back. And this is where it would stop when you stopped it. So see, it would not stop in the brake run. It would not stop until it got to that first set of drive tires. But, uh, yeah. And it also had a vertical transfer track. That's the enable panel right there. That's me back in uh, 2014. Uh, the enable panel is a dispatch, lift stop, right stop, east stop, open and close air gates. I always questioned why they uh, made these lights or these buttons uh, not have the guard on them like these do. So they were like this one. I'm like, why would we do that when the button is so close to the open close restraints button? Because people would... Uh, accidentally bumped that when they went to open and close the restraints. Or, I had a team member once that sneezed so hard he hit his head into one of the buttons and activated it. He wasn't the brightest. Um, and there's the E-step up there. So, pretty view. It's a shame, this ride had so much potential, but they, they cheaped out so much. It's, it's a one-trick pony, 30-second little thing. Pretty neat. Uh, this message would pop up uh, for the first like 30 minutes in the morning because other parks they let the team members do the block checks themselves, and so there was a there was a way that you could do it. But uh, Great America, they do not allow that. Here's some footage of uh, someone starting the ride. 
Trouble lights illuminated, so they were restarting it from a new step. The startup horn on this thing was obnoxious. It played for like 10 seconds straight if you hit a new step, and then it would play for another 5 seconds on and off to reset the right step, and then it would play another 10 seconds on and off while you reset the lift start. So, uh, when this ride opened, they didn't have any sort of fall protection on it like they did now. There's a budget cut. And so, uh, really no one was ever supposed to go up the lift, except for leads. So, of course, I took advantage of that. I remember the first time I went up there, it was, uh, the train was stopped, and it was super, it had rained all day, and these stairs are just steel. They're super slick. And so, I climbed up the thing, slipping the whole way up. But I had to do it because I wanted to climb up there. And then going down, I slipped like four times. I thought for sure I was going to slide all the way to the bottom. But now there's a uh, there's a wire on there that you have to attach to with the harness that catches you if you start to fall. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, no one knew about this, but uh, Goliath actually steel vengeance before steel vengeance. I bumped the trains together on accident when it first opened. Because uh, like I had said earlier, if someone let go of the dispatch buttons, the train would stop and it wouldn't move. It wouldn't let you pull it forward. And so when the, well, the way the blocks were originally set up was uh, the position that the train parked in the transfer was like right here. And the computer, the entrance, or the uh, the station block went all the way back here. And so there was a potential, there was a situation that I discovered where if you stopped a train just inside that little envelope where it thought the station was, the other train that would come in and park would uh, go, try to go to its normal position and hit that train. I just remembered... Uh, seeing that and I instantly knew what was going to happen so I pressed the e-stop and told the ride manager there like oh <laughs> this isn't good and so it stopped but then maintenance came out and they just restarted it so the uh, transfer track uh, drive charge started going and it went in and bumped it and then he pressed the e-stop after they bumped I'm like oh thank god thank god you saved it. them now not the 10 seconds before uh, you can see this is an even slower time 38.28 this was after closing. But uh, yeah, see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.